Thank you, everyone, for joining us for another Learning Lunch hosted by FormatApproved.com. My name is Brian Johnson. I'm the Senior Director of Online Education with Format Approved, and I'll be your moderator today. Today's Learning Lunch title is, What's Next? Make the Most of the ICD-10 Delay. We're joined today by Pamela Haney, the Director of Education and Training for Libman Education. Pam holds a number of certifications, as you can see, and she has 30-plus years of experience as an HIM director in small to medium-sized hospitals. Pam is also the winner of the 2013 AHIMA Triumph Mentor Award for her role in retraining coding staff. We are honored to share her expertise with you today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Brian. It's very, I'm very happy to be here today. All right. Well, before we begin the presentation, I'll let our audience look at the questions we're going to address today. But just remember as you look at these that if you have questions for our presenter at any time during this session, you can type those into the chat area. We will hold those till the uh, second half of our presentation, but then we'll address as many questions as time allows. If we do run out of time, we'll send those questions on to our presenter and she can address those questions in writing, which we'll send out in a follow-up email. Remember that all registered attendees of today's session will receive an email with links to both the slides and the recorded version of the event. So we always get that question, can we get the slides, can we get the recording? And you bet we will certainly send those out to you after the event. So watch your email inbox for those materials. All right, so with that uh, out of the way, Pam, again, thank you for joining us. And let's get right into it with how did we get here? How did this ICD-10 delay happen? Well, thanks, Brian. And I think most of us are aware that we had an ICD-10 delay that happened on April 1st. But really, what, what brought us to that delay? As most of us were getting ready, we knew we were six months to go live. What actually happened? And it really came down to this SRG formula. And the SRG formula is the sustainable growth rate. It's a budget cap that was passed into law in 1997, and the goal was to control physician spending. And interestingly, we have never since 1997 been able to get, put a permanent patch in place. So it's been an annual review of patching this growth rate for physicians. And what happened was the SRG was supposed to expire March 31st of this year. And if it did, it would mean a 24% decrease in physician's payment. So as you can understand, there was some real concern about this uh, expiration of this, of this SRG formula. And so there was a bipartisan group that worked on um, a resolution to really develop a permanent fix. It, uh, this group consisted of the Senate Finance Committee, the House Ways and Means Committee, and the House Energy and Commerce Committee. And interestingly, this group actually came up with a permanent solution, and there was bipartisan support for this solution. But what happened is they couldn't agree on how to fund this, solu this permanent solution. So there was a breakdown in negotiations. And in order for that deadline to be met, House Resolution 4302 was drafted and within this new uh, proposal, this House resolution, there was Section 212. And in Section 212, it specifically said that there would be a delay of ICD-10. So how did that happen? Well, as I said, there was bipartisan agreement on the SRG, but the funding was a concern. And so there was another one-year patch that was proposed. And because of this, the American Medical Association, the American College of Physicians, the American College of Surgeons, the American Osteopathic Association, as well as the American Academy of Family Physicians all opposed one more patch. It was really strong opposition from the medical community, as you can understand. And so in order to encourage this group to um, support this patch, they added ICD-10 as a carrot. That delay, they felt, would help that medical community support this one-year patch. So that's how it, this House Resolution 4302 came into being. It was actually introduced 
on March 25th in the House of Representatives. And what actually happened is kind of interesting. There was a, a suspension of the House rules. And this, it sounded a little um, uh, unconventional, but actually it's used quite often. When there are, are resolutions on the floor that aren't expected to have controversy or, or be challenged, and the Speaker determines which suspension motions the House will consider. And in this case, the Speaker considered this um, House Resolution 4302. There are no floor amendments that are required. And the member who offers a suspension can also include amendments to the bill. So after the um, House suspension comes up for, for debate, there's about 40 minutes on the motion, and that's it. At the end of the 40 minutes, the House casts a single vote, and there is no separate vote on the measure or any of the amendments. So to conduct a voice vote, which is how this resolution was, was voted for, the chair asks as many uh, are in favor say A, and as many are opposed say no, and the chair determines the result based on the volume of these votes. And as we've heard, there were many representatives who were actually out of the room when the call for the vote came. So that's actually how it worked its way through the House. So then we know that it went to the Senate, um, and the Senate uh, received this um, on March 31st. And there was, again, discussion at the House. There was actually about a three-hour debate. And during that time, Senator Wyden from Oregon attempted to introduce an alternate bill to the um, SRG patch. It w was a permanent fix, but it, it wasn't entertained. And at 6.30, the House Resolution 4302 passed with a final vote of 64 to 35. And the language that was put into this um, House Resolution 4302 actually stated that the Secretary of Health and Human Services may not, prior to October 1st of 2015, adopt ICD-10 code set as the standard for code sets under Section 1173C of the Social Security Act and Section 162.1002 of the Code of Federal Regulations. So the language didn't say we would be delayed until October 1st. It, the language actually said no sooner than October of 2015, which really um, um, put us at questioning that what does that really mean. Has CMS at this point said that they do plan to move ahead at that time, or, is, or are they still working out the details? Well, actually, on May 1st, uh, CMS was uh, uncharacteristically very quiet about the delay. <laughs> and, yes. Uh, because there was a comment made back in February at the ICD-10 summit in Washington where CMS adamantly said that ICD-10 will go ahead in October of 2014. So that's very quiet. Well, in the, on May 1st, there was a statement issued by CMS that said they will be issuing a final, uh, an interim rule very shortly. So we're still waiting for that interim rule. And if I could just ask one more question, and I don't know if anybody knows the answer to this, but is there, do we have a sense of where that one line that caused the delay, what the ultimate source of it was? Do we know what representative added that, or is it just sort of lost in the midst of the committee work? You know, we really don't know that. There, I know that um, there was some high-level discussions, and again, it was really to try to encourage the medical community to get on board with this one-year delay. Mm -hmm. As I said, they've been going through this delay for 17 years, and even though they had a permanent fix because they couldn't agree to fund it, they wanted another year to work through those funding issues. So uh, that has not been made public. We really don't know who actually authored that Section 212. Well, it's, uh, you know, the old metaphor about making sausage does come to mind here, uh, kind of opaque the process, but I guess this is where we are. Um, but it does raise the question, what's to stop it from happening again? What can people do to avoid another delay? Absolutely. And, you know, the American Health Information Management Association, which is a professional organization for those that work in health information, including coders, uh, put out a call for its members. Uh, they had an action alert. And there were over 10,000 recorded calls through the advocacy assistant of members calling their representatives. 
There were over 6,000 likes on Facebook. There were over 5,500 tweets. And over 1,000 letters were sent using Yahima Advocacy Assistant. Um, so there, there was a, a great response from the HIM community in terms of um, you know, their response and letting their legislative body know uh, the concerns that we had. There is um, a wonderful resource on the AHIMA website. It's called the Capitol Hill FAQs. And there are, uh, this really helps, especially when people go out and talk with peers and they hear you know, people uh, expressing concerns that may or may not be true. Uh, this is a really nice resource for folks. It's on the ahima.org website. It's available to anybody. And some of the questions uh, are example is, who has to comply with ICD-10? And the answer is, all anyone who is a HIPAA-covered entity must convert to ICD-10 uh, according to the, the guidelines. One of the other questions um, on the Capitol Hill FAQs is, has the pace of ICD-10 transition been too rapid? And you know, for many folks, we're just hearing about ICD-10 over the last year or two. But actually, um, it was proposed, as I said, in 1993. And really, for the last 14 years, we've known that the implementation would occur. So it really hasn't been that rapid. There's another question is, why is it important not to delay the implementation of ICD-10? And uh, as we may or may not know, that we've been using ICD-9 for 35 years. And there have been such major changes in medical care, in equipment, in procedures, and approaches, and methodologies, that from a coding perspective, it's very difficult for us to capture accurately what actually was performed. So again, this is a really good resource um, for people to, to visit. Um, and it's updated periodically as, as other FAQs come out. So we have the delay now. And I, uh, it's a great question. How is the ICD-10 delay going to impact coding professionals and, and the coding profession itself? Well, the interesting thing, I think, is that we were hearing the delay is projected to cost the healthcare environment between a billion and six billion dollars. And, and again, that's in, in lost um, uh, preparations and, and just overall. Um, one of the other concerns is that many organizations, I think most organizations, have begun their ICD-10 training for not only their coders, but certainly their CDI specialists, and just their organization in general. And the concern is that from a coding perspective, if you don't use this new technology, this new classification system that you've learned, you tend to start to lose your, your skill. And so how do we make sure that we preserve that skill set? And how do we approach using uh, ICD-10 and still having to use ICD-9? One of the other concerns is that from an educational perspective, many institutions began teaching their students ICD-10 in the fall of 2013 in preparation for when they'd be entering the workforce in the spring and fall of 2014. And so these coders have only been trained in ICD-10 classification system. Now, there are some similarities between ICD-9 and ICD-10, but there are some some differences, such as the coding guidelines, the level of specificity, the actual codes themselves are different. And so it's going to be a real challenge to um, go back and train our students in ICD-9. There are some tools available on the AHIMA website. In fact, they're offering um, just a brief training module in ICD-9 for those folks that have only been trained in ICD-10. Um, and there are other resources being developed out there by other vendors to really help mitigate that lack of knowledge in our new coding professionals. And as we know, with the implementation of ICD-10, there's going to be a real need for more and more folks that are, have a training and expertise in ICD-10. So it's, it's kind of a conundrum for those of us in training and education. Um, there, there's also a concern about accuracy. Um, when, you, when you apply a classification system in I-9, um, there's one um, uh, approach to that. When you need to sort of shift gears and code an ICD-10, that is a, a 
a new skill set and a little bit different. So there are some concerns about accuracy when you have coders having to go back and forth between two very different classification systems. And then we need to look at curriculum maps and career paths for students. How do we make sure that these students are getting the training that they need in ICD-9? They can also preserve their ICD-10 skills. And what are they going to need when they actually get out into the workforce? Well, I just have to say that, you know, because the delay came so late, I think there were so many people who were really, and CMS had been so adamant about the fact that there wasn't going to be another delay, and of course it wound up not being up to them. But, you know, there were people just really gearing up for that, deadline and of course I think part of the reason why they want some folks wanted the delay is that they may have been a little late to get ready but at the same time I just really feel for those students who are in longer programs getting trained from scratch and they were all geared up for that October deadline and now there's a real question about what they're going to do so I, I know you're going to share some resources later on with uh, folks on the call um, but I do think I, I really have great sympathy for them not to mention the providers the organizations that have done all of this planning and made all of this investment, and now, you know, there's real questions around uh, what they should do to adjust. Exactly, and I think there's there's a hesitation, which which I absolutely understand on, on the part of organizations. What do they do? What, where do they invest their money next? You know, there's so much uncertainty, and now that we've had all of these delays, is there going to be another delay? Right. Um, and you know resources are so, are so tight in healthcare organizations. Where do we put our money? And I think that's a real challenge as well. So the delay is also an opportunity. And I'm hoping you can share with us some ideas for what organizations can do to make the most out of the delay now that they've got this opportunity. And you know, I think one of the one of the important things, as we heard, uh, you know, the, from the medical community, um, they're very concerned about not only the SRG but also the implementation of ICD-10. And that was the carrot, as I spoke of earlier, that they were uh, using to help sway the medical community. And so I think in smaller organizations, smaller practices, or, or sole providers, um, they're really they not ready and they've taken their time because they don't have the resources or the depth of resources uh, to, to really prepare well for ICD-10. So I think one of the, the, the best things organizations can do is look to partner with providers. If there's training going on in a hospital, for example, uh, can you invite your, your medical community to come in and have their staff brought up to speed? Um, I think it's really important to make sure that as, as uh, an organization that we reach out to those that will help ensure our success across the organization and not just individually. One of the, the most important components, I believe, of ICD-10 is documentation improvement. And, and this is uh, for many reasons. Um, I think it's the number one success point for I-10, but I also believe it's also important in, in the ICD-9 world. This is an area that we can focus on now. It will, it will provide results in our current revenue cycle. It will provide results in the provider office, and it will also prepare us for ICD-10. One of the other components is to really develop dashboards. It's important to assess where you are now so that you'll know where you're going and how to get there. There are key metrics we'll talk about in a little bit about how to measure where you currently are and again to monitor that progress and really help define what are those steps you need to take. One of the things that um, I heard early on was the need for physicians to have to learn all of these new codes and all this new language in order to be successful in ICD-10. But when you really look at your documentation and you begin to assess where you are, and there's also a coding guideline specifically that taught in ICD-10 that says the coder can actually interpret what the physician says and apply the code. So it's not required for the physician to use this new language or these new terms in order to be successful. The important thing to note is in documentation, the physician needs to be as specific as possible. Now, there are some cues. There are some sort of um, high-level types of things that the physicians can tell us. So for example, if there's an injury, we need to know laterality. 
is it on the left-hand side, on the right-hand side for these paired, paired organs and so forth. So there are some levels of specificity that we can give um, physicians feedback on, but in terms of learning a new language or learning to speak in ICD-10, that's really not required. So this whole dashboard and the documentation improvement program will help organizations to identify where can we focus, be laser focused on our improvement to get the best results. The other nice thing about IC10, as much as I was disappointed we weren't moving ahead, and I think many people were disappointed, is that it does allow us, again, to spread out those costs over 18 months, actually now 15 months since I did these slides, because um, time is ticking. But it does give us, again, some more time so that if we do need to provide additional training for our staff, if we do need to do some, some more testing, if we do need to do some more dual coding, it does give us a little more time to get more proficient and and feel more comfortable that when we do go live in 2015, we'll be ready. And then lastly, make sure we stay on track. Uh, I think that uh, the worst thing we can do is sit back and say, phew, OK, I, I can wait a little bit longer. I think it's very important that whatever activities you're doing now to continue with those activities. And then as we go through, there are some other things that you can do, again, to ensure our success in October of 2015. Yes, I think the worst thing to do would be to say, well, I was behind the first time around, so now I'm just not going to do anything and sort of wind up almost in the same bad place again um, when you've got this opportunity to lay better plans. That's for sure. This is a question I love because I hear a lot of talk about this. Um, so does the delay in ICD-10 mean that we're just going to go ahead and skip it all together and go on to ICD-11, which, you know, who, the World Health Organization, my understanding is that they've already released ICD-11. So some people are saying we should just skip. Is that something that's going to happen? Well, uh, you know, I, it, uh, at this point, I never thought the delay would happen, so I never say never. Um, <laughs> Fair <but> enough. <laughs> there, <is> some, <laughs> there are some reasons why we really shouldn't skip to ICD-11 at this point. And remember, we started the conversion in 1993. It's been a long time coming. And uh, for many reasons, it's taken us a long time. And in the United States, even though ICD-10 and ICD-11 are worldwide classification systems, when we apply a classification system in the United States, we version it for, um, for our own purposes. We're one of the few countries that actually use our classification system that plays a part in our reimbursement. So there are really two components to the ICD-10 and ICD-11. The first is called CM, which is the clinical modification. And this is for the diagnostic side. So we, we take the, the universal ICD-10 and we modify it to meet the diagnoses and um, uh, the reporting that we do in the United States. And because we use ICD-10 uh, and ICD-9 as well for things such as reimbursement, but also for quality reporting. We do public reporting. We do lots of data collection and data analytics based on our classification system. So that takes time. We also, um, we also version, if you will, the procedure coding, and that's PCS in ICD-10, Procedural Coding System. And this is, uh, in ICD-10, the procedure coding is a totally new classification system for coders. The diagnostic coding will be a pretty smooth transition. Most coders who are coding in ICD-9, we need to learn some new coding guidelines. We need to learn some more specificity. We need to beef up our anatomy and physiology because it is more specific. But the whole procedure coding is brand new for coders. And so if we were, we, and that's been developed for ICD-10. So if we move to ICD-11 and don't implement I-10, then that whole procedure coding classification system has got to be reversioned again. So that takes a tremendous amount of time. In addition, as we talked in our first couple of slides, the whole rulemaking process is very complicated and very complex and very time consuming. So not only do we have to version, but then we have to work through all of this rulemaking process because the rulemaking process tells us what classification system we are required to use. Now, when you're saying rulemaking all, process, you're talking about the federal rulemaking process that would be the same, you know, if you're talking about HIPAA or anything like this. Uh, is that correct? 
Yeah, that's correct. So CMS would have to would have to um, issue a, a, an interim rule to say we will move to ICD ICD 11, and then there will be all of these varied stakeholders who would have all these discussions. And you know, we've got vendors, we've got providers, we have insurers, we have all of these stakeholders that all have to come together and have to agree. And then we have to get that final rule approved, and then there's usually a two-year implementation. So it's a very long process. Yeah, I mean, you're looking at, I'd say, oh. what, a three- to five-year process for a typical rule? It seems like it takes them forever to get through a rule. Well, actually, as we said, even if we started today, we would not expect ICD-11 until after 2020. So it's a good six years wow. for that. And that's that's uh, if, if we don't have any major delays along the way. Um, the other important point is that ICD-9, as I said, has been in place for about 35 years. It's an antiquated system, uh, about uh, 11,000 codes or whatever. ICD-10 is a brand new application um, classification system new codes, new structure, everything is brand new with ICD-10. We also have around 68,000 codes, so we have a tremendous increase in the number of codes. ICD-11 is based on ICD-10. So if we were to change from I-9 to I-11, we'd still be in the same boat we are now with I-10. Um, so I feel it's important that ICD-10 will really pave the way to success in ICD-11. And as I said, it's about six years out Again, that's best case scenario going forward. So uh, for all of those reasons, um, uh, that means we'd have to use I-9 for another six years. Uh, again, it, the, our accuracy is good, but we can't get the level of specificity. Um, and for all those other reasons, it's really important that we move to ICD-10. Well, I think that's just very interesting stuff because you hear this all the time that maybe we should just go to ICD-11, but when you go through the points there, it's uh, fairly compelling, I think, that that's just not going to happen, and we just can't wait that long to update the coding set. So that's um, thank you for sharing that. Sure. So we hear a lot about dual coding. How should organizations handle dual coding projects? Well, and there's, there's many ways uh, to handle dual coding projects. It's, um, it's important to, I believe, develop the ICD-10 workforce um, because the key component is who is applying those codes that are populating not only reimbursement and all those other things we talked about, the quality indicators and public reporting and all of that. So it's very important to maintain the skill set of the ICD-10 workforce. I believe that the, the ICD-10 training needs to continue. And you know, when you're coding in ICD-10 as a part of a dual coding project, it's important to look at variances. What, what, how did we code a chart in I-9, and how does it code it in I-10? And often those variances are not black and white. It's not easy to say, is it a coding factor? Is it a documentation factor? Or is it part of the new classification system? So it's really important to really to be able to collect this information, and not just in a short period of time, but over a period of time that would encompass all of your patient types, all of your, your different providers, and the way they document. So it's important to do that data collection. The financial modeling and analysis is important as well. Um, and we like to look at sort of four categories of what we call errors or coding errors. And these would in include, first of all, insufficient documentation. This would be when there's not enough documentation in the medical record for the coder to identify the most specific code. The, this would identify when you have opportunities for documentation improvement. The second category of errors that I think is helpful to look at is the DRG shift, the Diagnostic Related Group, which is the the way that we classify inpatient uh, reimbursement under Medicare. And so one way is to look at the DRG that was assigned with all of the codes in ICD-9 and compare that by coding the same chart with ICD-10 classification system and look to see if there's what's called a DRG shift. This would change um, the financial impact of that particular record. So you may increase your reimbursement or you may decrease your reimbursement. But it's important to understand with the, uh, with the ICD-10 implementation what kind of financial impact you'll have on your specific medical records. The third category of error is a DRG change where there's no financial impact. 
But again, there may be documentation issues or there can be an issue on the coding side. If you're coding in, in ICD-9, you come out with a specific DRG and you code it in ICD-10 and you come to a different DRG, but there isn't a financial impact, there may be an opportunity to improve that coding with either improved documentation or coder training. And then the fourth category, I sort of put these in buckets when you're doing your dual coding project. The fourth bucket would be if you code that medical record in I-9, you code it again in ICD-10, and there's no impact, no DRG change, no financial impact, no issue of insufficient documentation. Those are the records you don't need to focus on. So it, oftentimes you can identify specific providers, you can identify specific patient types, certain procedures, where it looks like there'll be no impact. So those are, those are the types of cases that you don't want to focus on. So it's, but it's important, I think, to get a current state assessment of where you are. And as we talked about, you want to identify those documentation improvement programs. Um, I think many organizations have a CDI program or a documentation improvement program, um, but it's, it's real important to capture that documentation at the point of service or as close to the point of service as possible. I like to call, um, when we hound physicians for additional information, kind of query fatigue. As a provider, they're hounded all day long by coders saying, you know, we need this piece of information, we need that piece of information. And when we can get that documentation captured as, as specific as possible up front during the patient's stay, it then will make the coding process much easier and allow that claim to go out the door and the data to be collected um, in a good way. It's also, as part of your dual coding project, it's also important to look at the workflow because you want to decrease the impact of productivity and again you want to decrease that those queries that uh, that need to be um, created because that will slow down your coding process. It's also important to continue end-to-end -end testing and in order to do this you need to have some data in ICD-10 in order to complete that testing. You want to make sure that your your claims are going out the door appropriately and you get reimbursed appropriately. And so in order to do that, it's really important to have some data in ICD-10. And the purpose of your dual coding project should really be, where do we need to focus our training? We want to make sure we can stabilize our revenue cycle operations, and we also want to identify any risks that may uh, put the organization um, in jeopardy with the implementation of ICD-10. So there are a couple of options when you're doing a dual coding project. Uh, there's really three sort of recommendations in terms of how to approach a, a dual coding project. And the most common are, first of all, what we call dual coding. This would be where there are two coders, and the first coder would code that particular record in ICD-9, and then a second coder would come through and code that same record in ICD-10, and so you would have some comparison data. And this would be based on a sample. And the sample can be your top types of patients that you see, maybe your top 10 DRGs, whatever that sample size is. But you really want to focus on those high volume, maybe problem prone, maybe um, very active providers, certain departments within your organization that are active. Because again, you want to look at those, at those cases that will give you the best data on where to focus your, your preparations and your efforts. The second approach is what we would call concurrent dual coding. And this, again, would take a sample. Uh, again, a sample would be a particular diagnosis or a particular department or a particular DRG. And this is where one coder uh, would code a chart in ICD-9, and then they would also code that chart in ICD-10. So you have the same coder. So you have a little bit of um, inter-rater reliability that's uh, reduced using the same coder. Um, so that will give you, uh, it may give you uh, some different results, uh, but it's just a different approach. And then the third option uh, that we see, uh, a common option, is what we call double coding. And this would be where you code from a particular date you code everything in ICD-9 and ICD-10, and you would probably use the same coder to do that. So for example, we've worked with some clients who have decided they're going to code all of their EDs as of a particular date in dual coding. So every ED visit for a period of time will be coded in a dual coding format. And then they'll take those results and do some data analytics and really identify, again, where their, where their, um, where the, their success rate is and also where they need to focus, um, again, their preparations for ICD-10.
So this is a great question, and I think it ties in well with what you're talking about uh, in the last slide. In terms of productivity impacts with ICD-10, what should people expect for that, and how can they plan around it? Well, we're hearing all kinds of um, stories about, you know, nothing, no impact in coder productivity to, you know, tremendous amounts of productivity impact. And I think that um, from an industry perspective, we're hearing between 30 and 50 percent impact. And recently I did see uh, AHIMA come out with um, a, a projected impact of around 53 percent impact on productivity. And, you know, whether you're a large organization or a small organization, that, that's a pretty um, scary uh, statistic to look at. And you know, what leads to that productivity? What, what's causing that? And, and it's, it's multifactorial. Coders have to learn two new code sets, and not only learn two new code sets, as we spoke earlier, but they need to apply those for a period of time. Um, there may be times when you know you have claims that are rejected. You've got to go back, and if it was prior to the ICD-10 implementation date, you need to maintain those ICD-9 skills in order to get paid appropriately. Um, so it's it's very important for coders to keep both of those skill sets, and, and that takes time and it takes ongoing training and support. I talked earlier about the increased number of codes. There are about 13,000 codes in ICD-9, and there is around 68,000 codes in ICD-10. So there's, that just speaks to the level of specificity um, that coders need to be aware of. And the challenge is when you're coding a medical record, coders now will review the entire medical record, but because that level of specificity, it will require much more time for coders to go through that medical record and really try to identify that level of specificity um, that will make a difference in their coding. We also want to avoid, if we can, the physician queries, but there are times where um, in ICD-10, there are some what we call non-specific codes, so if you cannot reach that level of specificity based on the documentation and the medical record, you can code a non-specific code. There are many more of those in ICD-9 than ICD-10, and there may be instances where you just cannot apply that code because you need some specificity that is not in that medical record, so you will need to query the physicians. And again, that takes time. The coder needs to create the query, it needs to get out to the physician, they need to get that query response back, then documentation needs to be in the medical record to support that change in the coding. So that all plays a part in, in productivity. And then there are coding guidelines. There are, as I spoke earlier, there are some similarities between the classification systems, but there are certainly some new guidelines that coders need to be aware of. Many coders today know these guidelines in their head and they're able to apply those very quickly. With a new system, it's going to take time to understand those coding guidelines, make sure they're applied appropriately, and it takes time to use their resources to make sure they're coding as best they can. Could you give us an the example other... of, oh, I'm sorry to interrupt, uh, Pam. I, I just thought it might be useful. If you could give us an example of a coding guideline that's different. Oh, sure. Uh, a common one is currently when we code a cardiac event, uh, for example, an acute uh, myocardial infarction, um, when a patient comes back in due to um, uh, sequela or uh, complications from that initial event, um, the coding guideline tells us if it's within eight weeks, we would still code that as being um, an active acute uh, condition. With ICD-10, that guideline has changed to four weeks. So there are guidelines that are very specific um, like that, that again, a coder, right now we know these in our head, but going forward, and there are many other types of guidelines that are not as specific for conditions that we may not code all the time. So again, a coder would need to look at their resources, look things up, and we do have some tools. We use, many coders use encoders. Uh, but again, we need to be sure that we are coding to that level of specificity. And if we have a guideline, we're going to have to follow up again, review that medical record to try and see what's the history of this particular patient, where were they seen before. And sometimes that means we've really got to dig. So that does impact our productivity. And some of the tools, uh, I, I talked a little bit about an encoder, uh, which are tools that coders use. Uh, but it doesn't take the place of the coder's knowledge and expertise. Uh, 
There are many organizations that are looking to uh, computer-assisted coding. And I just wanted to mention that quickly. Um, I think computer-assisted coding is um, a tool that is in development. Um, they're very expensive. They use a natural language processor. And what the, the computer-assisted coding tool does is it reads through the electronic health record, the documentation that's in that medical record, and identifies what we call codable words. For example, if there's a history of something, that uh, natural language processor may not pick that up, as opposed to if it's an active condition. There are um, estimates that using a computer-assisted coding application would increase coder productivity by about 20%. Um, and it also helps to streamline the search through the electronic health records. So it, it addresses some of that productivity issue. My concerns from a computer-assisted coding perspective is that it's very expensive technology right now. I think that it needs to evolve a little bit further. It also will require the coder to review whatever the, the CAC application has identified as codable. Um, so there's not a lot of savings, I think, in terms of productivity at this point. Um, but I think as the technology advances. The other concern is with the elect it only works on an electronic health record. So if an organization is a hybrid where they have some paper records and electronic records, it will only identify those codable terms in the electronic component. So the coder will still need to read through. And as you know, physician penmanship isn't always as good as it should be. And so it takes time to read through those manually created uh, documents. Um, so for those reasons, I think CAC is on the horizon. I think it's, it will be a great tool, one more tool in the coder toolbox. Um, but you know, to see the 20% the uh, improvement in productivity, we'll have to wait and see. That's interesting, yeah. Uh, clearly that is beyond, I think, the ability of, you know, a machine certainly cannot replace a professional coder. That's obvious. Um, I can see how maybe it would be useful in some ways, but that's interesting. So what's the best strategy then to prepare coders for ICD-10? What do they need to do? Well, I think the very first thing is we really need to assess the current coder competency and you know whether the coder has experience in I-9 or not. What kind of proficiency do they have in ICD-10? And then from there, we need to build their 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 skill set. Um, and it's real important to continue, not only do we train our coders, but then provide ongoing training and education so that they can utilize their skills that they've learned and apply them. As I spoke earlier, the, the level of specificity will require additional knowledge in anatomy and physiology. And many coders are, are knowledgeable in medical terminology, anatomy and physiology, disease pro process, as well as pharmacology. But Again, the, it's important to understand the mechanics of A and P and this foundational knowledge. The interesting thing with the uh, procedural classification system in ICD-10, before we used to be able to code an ICD-9 based on acronyms or the procedure name. The change in ICD-10 is we no longer can do that. We need to know the intent of the procedure and know exactly what's being performed in order to code it correctly. And so that's a major change for coders. And that's where that level of training in anatomy and physiology will be extremely important for them to be successful. We've heard from Ahima that the average coder will require about 60 hours of training in order to be proficient in ICD-10. And that, that's a lot of time when coders are trying to be productive and trying to maintain their, uh, their metrics within their organization. That um, taking 60 hours for training is tough. And so again, we have that about a 15 month um, delay, so that will give us some time to be able to to build those skills and get that training for our coders. And as I mentioned, they really need to master the surgical approach, the tools, as well as the techniques, because the new PCS system will precisely define procedures in detail. There are actually 31 what we call root operations. And these are based, again, on the intent of the procedure. So the, the procedural coding is going to be very challenging. The, the, the caveat to that is that 
our PCS coding system will only be used in an inpatient setting. It won't be used in the physician's office or in an outpatient setting. Um, so for the inpatient coders, it's extremely important that they have a, a lot of training and, and the ability to, to really build their proficiency in the surgical classification system. So tell us, please, if you could, about some of the resources that are, that are available to folks to help them with the transition. Well, I think it's important that you reach out to your vendors. Um, our vendors are key in our success, uh, whether it's your uh, health information system, whether it's your encoder, whatever it might be, because vendors um, have been very active in preparation, and they have some great tools um, as well as some, some training opportunities. So I think it's important to, to continue to develop that relationship with the vendors that you use. Um, I would mentioned earlier the American Health Information Management Association. They um, have a wealth of information, and this particular link will take you specifically to ICD-10. There are some tools. There are, there's updates of what's going on. It's a very helpful website. Always CMS. Uh, there is a specific uh, section of the CMS website. I, I think in the past, personally, I've had some challenges navigating the CMS website, uh, but this particular link will take you directly to ICD-10. It's a great way to stay up to date. Uh, you can monitor when changes come out, especially that interim rule on the uh, ICD-10 implementation. It's a, great, um, it's a great site to visit, as well as HIMSS, which is the Healthcare Information and Management Systems and Society. Um, they really focus on the technology side of healthcare, but again, I think it's a it's a nice um, resource for folks to visit um, to stay up to date. I couldn't help but laugh a little bit uh, at your comment on the CMS website because as someone who spends a fair amount of time running around on the CMS website, I certainly sympathize. Uh, it's there. There's a lot of great resources there. Finding them is sometimes the tricky part. So I just want to remind the audience that. Uh, we're going to send the link, the, the slides out after the event. So if you're trying to scribble down those uh, links real fast, uh, you don't necessarily have to worry about that because we're going to give these to you in the follow-up as well. Okay, so let's get down to sort of the brass tacks here. What are the steps that organizations need to take to really build success in ICD-10? Absolutely. Well, you know, again, I think one of the most important things is to recognize that it is an organizational initiative. You know, initially we were talking with organizations and we heard, oh, that's just a coding issue, or things like, you know, well, you know, we've done other implementations before, I don't have to worry about it um, from a PFS director. Um, I've heard a, a, a CFO say, well, you know what, our coders are just going to have to code faster. And again, so it really needs to be an organizational in initiative, understanding that it's widespread, it's IT, it's, it's patient financial services, it's health information management, it's coding, it's clinical. Everybody plays a part in this success. So it really needs to be an organizational focus. And I think it's important um, if, if organizations have not developed an ICD-10 oversight group that you do develop that. Include key departments and staff. Make sure that that communication is going out to everybody. And even if you're a small organization, you can roll that sort of ICD-10 oversight into committees or groups that you currently have, just to kind of get a sense of, of what do we need, what's important to us, and again, to monitor those activities as you prepare to ramp up for 2015. What are your metrics? What are the things that are important to us? What's going to ensure our success? And what are the decisions that have to be made? So I think it's important to have that recognition. The next step, I think, is to improve the clinical documentation improvement. Uh, again, I think it's, it's vital. It's, um, it's, a, it's, an, it's a program that needs to be concurrent. It needs to be active. Um, there should be a feedback loop um, so that um, we understand that what, we've, what we're doing is making progress. It's improving our coding. It's improving our public reporting. There's many reasons why it needs to be accurate. And not only for the preparation but of ICD-10, but it's, it's critical for ICD-9 as well. We need to look at the revenue cycle and how do we make sure that our revenue cycle is intact, not only now but going forward. And we do that through auditing. It's important to understand that we get, we're getting paid for the services that we provide accurately. We need to make sure that our documentation is correct and supports the codes that we're applying as well as the codes, the services that we're billing. 
It helps improve our processes and make sure that um, the whole workflow is working in, in concert to make sure that we're successful. It also helps to identify those areas of financial risk. As I spoke earlier, we want to make sure that we identify those areas where we can make changes to improve. And then, as I said, the feedback to the providers, to the coders, and to the other clinical staff that are involved in the revenue cycle is really important. There are certain key metrics, and these would vary by organization. What are those components of your success that are important to you? Some of the standard ones that, that we look at in organizations is what's called DNFB, or, or Discharge Not Final Build, or DNFC, which is Discharge Not Final Coded. And these would be the, the records or the dollars that are sitting waiting to be processed. And that is um, important to the bottom line of an organization. We want our claims to be coded correctly. We want the charges captured correctly. And we want the claims out the door. And we want our reporting to be timely. We also want to look at the number of queries that we're doing. And by looking at the number of queries, it helps us to identify potentially where our documentation improvement projects should be focused. Also, are there certain providers that we need to work with? Are there um, other data collectors that we need to make sure are doing what they need to do to help decrease the number of queries that we need to um, issue? Also important as part of our metrics, we need to look at our denials. Why are claims being denied? Is it because of a coding issue? Is it because of documentation? Have we, and sometimes a claim can be denied just for one little T that isn't crossed or an I that isn't dotted. And we need to understand that, because that's where we can make the best improvements. So those are the kind of um, top of mind kind of metrics that you want to make sure that you identify. And there may be other areas that you may find through your revenue cycle monitoring that you can develop a metric and begin to really drill down and see how do we improve what we do. And then lastly, stay the course. Uh, I can't say this enough. I think that it's really important that we don't sit back and say, oh, I've got another 15 months. You know, I can wait till next year. I think it's really important that we stay the course. Interestingly, um, from a training and education perspective, um, our, our business took off in January of 2014. And we attribute that to when, when people started to recognize, oh my goodness, it's 2014. ICD-10 is coming this year. That's when people started to get concerned and worried. So I'm, I don't want people to wait and say, I don't have to think about ICD-10 until 2015. We really have a great opportunity now to really make some, some great progress and great success so that when we do implement ICD-10, we'll be where we need to be. Well, I certainly would uh, second that notion. Um, we've got a little bit of time left for questions from our audience. So I'll tell you a little bit about the resources uh, we're making available to attendees of this session. After those questions, let's go ahead and get to questions from our audience. If you uh, have held your question till the end, go ahead and ask it. And if we don't have enough time to get to your question, I'm sure that Pam would be happy to follow up with you and answer those questions uh, in writing. So the first question, Pam, is what should providers ask their EHR vendors about transitioning to ICD-10? Well, a couple of things. I think, first of all, you need to be sure that they are ready for ICD-10. Um, and don't take it just verbally. You need something in writing from your vendor. Um, I think it's important to talk to your vendors about end-to-end -end testing. That's going to be crucial. And in order to do that, you've got to have your dual coding project so that you populate a database, whether it's a test database or however you capture that ICD-10 data, so that you can do accurate end-to-end -end testing and know that your vendor is going to be able to support, as I said, from the data data collection all the way through to the remittance uh, being reconciled. So it's real important that you know from your vendors their readiness, um, that they can handle end-to-end -end testing, and then also um, talk to your vendors about opportunities for training and education. Uh, many of the vendors are also, I know 3M is offering some training, and there are other vendors that, are, that have some really good education specific to their tools. All right. Our next question, I think we have time maybe for one more, is how does ICD-10 relate to SNOMED? And do providers need to think about how the two relate? 
Well, there is a correlation between the development of ICD-10 and SNOMED. Um, at this point, you know, there's also GEMS, uh, the, the mapping between ICD-9 and ICD-10. Those are all things that happen on the, on the back end. Um, for folks who aren't familiar with it, can you explain what SNOMED is for them? Sure. It, it's a classification system uh, that's been used in the past to help develop the, the infrastructure of our classification system. Um, I, I can't tell you off the top of my head what the acronym stands for. Um, but it's clinically based. Um, and I believe that the, um, the National Library of Medicine owns that classification system now. Um, but it, it's the infrastructure on what our classification systems are used for. All right, so to, re to return to what you're saying then, the two are related sort of on the back end, but it's not something that providers need to think about too much, or how would you? Absolutely, absolutely. yeah. We, we're end users of the classification system, and so we just need to be focused on the ICD-10 application or the ICD-9, whatever classification system that we're using. All right, well, we'll save the rest of our questions for the follow-up. Uh, we have limited time, so we're going to assemble those audience questions, and we'll post any answers uh, to th in the follow-up email that we'll send out after this event. I'd like to remind all of our attendees, um, whether you are able to attend this session live or you just registered for it, we're going to send out an email with links about the slides and the video recording of the session, and this video will also be available on our YouTube channel. I want to thank you so much for joining us today, Pam. Really great information there um, throughout the session. Great. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. And thank you to our audience as well for attending today's session. Uh, remember that if you'd like to learn more about Libman Education, they have a lot of great training on coding. You can go to www.libmaneducation.com. Maybe you'd like to say just a little bit about what you've got there um, available to folks, Pam. Absolutely. We have a suite of training. Uh, we, uh, we're focused on ICD-10, and we're developing um, a suite of ICD-9 applications as well. We have training for acute care. We also have training for post-acute care in home health, hospice, um, and skilled nursing. And we also have certification prep classes. So for folks that are considering taking a certification, such as the Certified Coding Associate or the coding, Certified Coding Specialist through AHIMA, we will help um, coders achieve their certification. And then we partner with coders throughout their career to provide ongoing education to maintain their certification and, and support them in their career goals. And for folks who are interested in training through Formed Approved, you can visit www.formedtraining.com. We have a couple of ICD-10 classes that are uh, sort of based on Libman core classes that we've adapted to our style of learning, so that may be of interest to people. If uh, they prefer the Formed Approved approach, but they want that great Libman content, those are courses that we've developed in close partnership, along with our regular HIPAA Meaningful Use and PQRS titles. All of those are available with a special 20% discount. Be sure to use the discount code LIBMAN during checkout to receive that discount. Visit FormatApproved.com to learn more about our upcoming learning lunches. There's a big learning lunch button there you can see on your screen. It's just like the one on our homepage, and that will take you to the list of upcoming webinars and workshops. Uh, you can learn more about the events and register there. Our next learning lunch will air June 12th with EHR and Meaningful Use expert Jim Tate and has the title Meaningful Use, A State of Confusion. Just as there's been delays in ICD-10, it seems like every uh, month brings some new kind of delay to Meaningful Use as well. And now I think there's a lot of confusion about that program as well. So we're going to get some clarity from Jim Tate next Thursday if you can join us. Keep an eye on your email box and our homepage for other upcoming topics. And thank you again for joining us today.